Hello everybody and welcome back to OMB Reviews. I am the critic who is a cynic. Hope we're doing well and today we're doing a box office preview for Thor Love and Thunder which is going to be the next real test of whether or not the MCU is on the decline, financially speaking, or not. We'll also talk a little bit about the current box office for Jurassic World Dominion. I have a review up of Dominion that I was able to record and post just last night, so go check that out if you have not done so already. And so we'll talk about these films and other things as well. Before going any further, though, please make sure you smash that like button, light up that fire button if you're watching over on Odyssey, and also make sure that you are subscribed to the channel with that bell notification on that way you know every time a new video or live stream goes live on the channel. So we got some box office preview updates here. Uh, really, a couple of smaller films are being updated with The Black Phone, which I don't really know all that much about, except that it's a horror film of sorts. It's now dropping 5% in the projections that Box Office Pro has for it, dropping to $17 to $22 million in its opening weekend, whereas Elvis which is the new Bars Baz Lerman film. Probably mispronouncing that in some way. But anyway, the Baz Lerman film expected to open at 35 to $50 million. And the only thing I know about that film is the creepy performance by Tom Hanks, where he says something to the effect of, we are like little children, and it's just cringy all around. <laughs> so even though the performance from the lead actor looks pretty good, Tom Hanks looks like he's going to be trying to distract away in every single scene he's in. And personally, I'm not okay with that. We also have, of course, the continued numbers. These numbers haven't really changed all that much for Minions. The rise of Gru, 65 to $80 million. And I mentioned in previous videos, I'm going to be very interested to see exactly which film does better when it comes to Lightyear versus Minions. Just It seems to me Minions is going to appeal a lot more to the younger demographic. It's going to appeal to a lot more families. Whereas Lightyear just seems that it's trying to capture the hearts of those who grew up with the... <laughs> franchise a little bit. Yeah, I know, Raver. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy to think that they are trying to again, gear this towards kids, but again, it's a just clear cash grab opportunity when they've already, I think, squeezed the Toy Story franchise for more than what it's worth at this point, and I don't really know exactly who would be interested in seeing this film other than ones. I know, River is just not happy at all about this film actually being made. But let's talk about the actual big film that I'm sure a lot of people have some interest in, whether they are interested in actually going to see it, or whether they are interested in seeing whether the film is going to fail or not. Based on these early projections, it looks like this film is not going to be a financial failure, as it is expected to open between $155 million and $205 million, with its end domestic range being somewhere between $350 and $495 million. Now, what's most interesting about these projections is when you put this up against the other Thor films. So when it comes to the actual Thor films themselves, as you'll notice here... The opening weekend for the first Thor film, even when adjusted for inflation, was only around $76 million, whereas the second film, which was arguably terrible garbage, was $96.7 million, and Thor Ragnarok was one hundred and twenty-five point four. And so they are already projecting this to be the highest grossing Thor film of all time, at the very least, when it comes to the opening weekends. Now, is this likely going to happen? I would probably say yes. I think there is a lot of goodwill for the Thor franchise, as a lot of people did enjoy Thor Ragnarok. I know there are a lot of people that did not, because it definitely deviates away from the previous iterations of the character. I've already heard many people make very valid claims about how it definitely deviates away from the comic version of the character, but I am one of the persons that definitely was a fan of Thor Ragnarok. I find it to be quite entertaining. And again, to each their own when it comes to whether or not they find the film entertaining or not. But I do think that because of that goodwill for Thor Ragnarok, and obviously that was when Taika Waititi got involved in the project as well, I think that some of that goodwill will carry over into this film. And so it does not surprise me all that much that this movie is expected to do much better even than the last Thor film. What I do find interesting, though, is that the trailer for this film is definitely causing some division amongst fans and obviously amongst people who have become very tired of the MCU. The MCU has become incredibly formulaic. They have just become the same garbage over and over again, and now Disney is becoming that much more abrasive and that much more clear in their attempt to try and push identity politics down every single person's throat. We saw that especially with films like Doctor Strange 2, which on top of everything was just a really bad, poorly made movie. And Thor Love and Thunder, to me, honestly, based on the trailers alone, kind of looks like it's going to be a bit of a hot mess. Not to mention, of course, you have this pushing of female Thor, which just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And and people can try and argue saying, well, it's in the comics. Yeah, but what version of the comics are we talking about here? What decade of the comics are we trying to talk about? Are we talking about modern day comics or are we talking about classic story comics? I think you'll start to realize and understand that we're really dealing with a new iteration of the comics that focuses more 
on pushing identity politics rather than pushing actual good storytelling. And let's just be honest here. Thor is Thor. I don't know how else I could possibly, you know, really push it at this point in time. But regardless of all that, Thor Love and Thunder is expected and is projected to do quite well in its opening weekend. Whether or not it makes this much or whether or not it holds from week one to week two, that is, of course, going to be the big test. And we will be following that, uh, obviously, as the movie goes on. Because if there's one thing we can say about the first Thor film and also Thor Ragnarok was that it had very positive word of mouth. And so, therefore, is able to lead those films to a lot of success. So, for instance, Thor, even when you adjust the films for inflation... You'll notice that the first Thor film made about half a billion dollars. Now, this was back in 2011, so this was towards the very beginning of the creations of the MCU, of the, uh, you know, really kind of this early pre-Disney era when I believe this was still when it was under Paramount, if I'm not mistaken, and I very well could be. But regardless of all of that, this was very early on, and I thought that Kenneth Branagh did a very good job in putting this for uh, putting the story forward. It ended up being one of my favorite films of the MCU, especially of the early MCU, and I definitely have a bias towards the story of Thor, again, channels OMB reviews after all, where I saw the Dark World really just fell off a cliff and was terrible, which is, I think, why... People like me, for instance, thought that Thor Ragnarok might have a little bit more difficulty because people would still have that bad taste of Thor The Dark World in their mouth. But Taika Waititi was essentially able to reinvent the franchise, was essentially able to reestablish a new voice for the franchise, focusing more on his level of comedy, which, whether you like it or not, did appeal to a much broader swab of people, which led to it to be the highest grossing film in the Thor uh in the Thor era, essentially, or in the Thor series, making eight hundred and around eight hundred seventy million dollars worldwide. Now, based on these early estimates, the fact that this film is expected to have a bigger opening than even Thor Ragnarok, and the fact that this film is also expected to have a massive presence in the foreign market, it's not without it's not outside the realm of possibility for Thor Ragnarok, or rather for Thor: Love and Thunder to even exceed that of Thor Ragnarok and potentially even be a billion dollar film. We have to, of course, wait to see what the actual numbers are. We have to wait and see what the, the international numbers are going to be. I don't know at this point in time whether or not Thor is going to have a release in China um, because obviously that's going to be a pretty big indicator of just how much money this film can actually make or the perceived wealth of this film. Remember that really China is kind of a bit of fool's gold in a lot of ways. Not to mention, of course, it gives money to the Communist Party of China. Speaking of giving money to the Communist Party of China, and I'm going to be obviously calling out Disney every single second I can, we do also need to call out Jurassic World Dominion because, as you can see here, right now it is projected to make $325 million worldwide, and a big part of that is expected to be because of its release in China. That's right. Jurassic World Dominion is going to be released in China. So this is a uh, this is a movie from Universal, and this is a film that is going to play very well in the international markets and is expected to play pretty well in China. And as I've mentioned in previous videos, I'm not just going to call that Disney or even Warner Brothers. I'm going to call it all studios that do any deals or workings with the CCP because millions upon millions of dollars go to the Communist Party there and therefore help to fund their human rights violations. And I think that every single studio who does dealings with them deserves to be called out, especially when you have a film like Jurassic World Dominion, which I gave a C plus to, meaning it's okay, but there are a lot of issues and problems that exist within the film itself. And really, in a lot of ways, it is a shell of what the Jurassic Park franchise should be, which really, it shouldn't have been a franchise in the long run. I'm someone who personally loved the first Jurassic Park film, actually enjoyed The Lost World, even though I do find it to be more of a guilty pleasure than anything else. And then ever since then, it's kind of fallen off a little bit. The first Jurassic World was an interesting concept, brought in new characters, but in the end, it was just a bit of bleh. And then Fallen Kingdom was trash, and this film, though better than Fallen Kingdom, is still not saying all that much. It seems that a lot of people are starting to agree with this concept of this film not being all that great, especially with that two hour and 26 runtime, it definitely runs a little bit long here. But as you can see from the Metacritic score right now, it's from 51 critics, generally unfavorable, though we all know critics really don't mean a whole lot of anything. So let's go ahead and look to see what the few, because there haven't been that many, um, uh, reviews from actual fans, from actual people. I believe that the reporting going on right now is that the Rotten Tomato score is in the 70s, I think, which is not all that great for an audience rating score. And you're seeing something similar here amongst the reviews that have been posted on to Metacritic, with one giving it a 10, one giving it a 5, and two giving it a 7. And I think that you're going to find that a lot of audiences are probably going to fall in that 6 to 7 category, which in the long run isn't all that good for the box office prospects. That being said, 
with this film expected to have a massive international presence. We'll have to wait and see, one, what it does this opening weekend. They're projecting it to make $325 plus million this opening weekend, where it ends up falling at the end of its second weekend, and also where Top Gun Maverick ends up falling into this discussion as well, as Top Gun Maverick is projected to have a massive hold once again. It had a record hold in its week one to week two drop. It's expected to have another record hold. I think that's probably going to be a record hold when you add in all of the numbers together and just how it was in the 20s for its first to second week, and now it's expected to be in the 30s for its uh, uh, second second to third week as far as the hold is concerned, which is just insane. And this film, Top Gun Maverick, is, again, well on the way to marching towards that billion-dollar mark, whereas even people over at Deadline are saying that Multiverse of Madness is actually charging towards a billion dollars. So interesting that they are bringing that up now at this point in time, even though they have earlier said that they expected it to cap out at 950. I do as well. Is a billion dollars still possible? Absolutely. But is it slowing down? Yes. Is uh, having films or having films like... Uh, Top Gun Maverick and Jurassic World Dominion flooding the market and making a lot more people interested in those films versus multiverse. Absolutely. Especially since if I had to compare the films, Top Gun Maverick is easily the best of the list, being an A film, whereas Jurassic World Dominion is a C plus film, whereas Multiverse of Madness is kind of that D minus D film. And so I think that the box office will probably end up reflecting that in the long run. But as we all know, box office is not the arbiter of truth. It is not the arbiter of what is good or not. We know that there have been terrible films that have made over a billion dollars at the box office even and I suspect that the likely will happen again for films like Jurassic World Dominion and potentially even for Multiverse of Madness we'll have to of course wait and see what those numbers end up being by the end of their run but those are the numbers as they currently stand so are you excited for Jurassic World Dominion do you think that the film is going to be a massive hit do you think it's going to be the biggest of the films for the Jurassic World franchise, but also obviously we're looking ahead to Thor the Dark World, <laughs> not Thor the Dark World, uh, if only, if only, I almost wish we were looking forward to Thor the Dark World at this point, based on the trailers for Thor Love and Thunder, which by the way, I don't know if anyone saw Jurassic World Dominion, but there is a trailer for Thor the Lo Love and Thunder, and it's one of the newer trailers there, and what I find interesting is that they show the sequence where I believe it's Zeus in the trailer, strips uh, Thor of all of his garments and leaves him naked, and in the trailer that they released online, which received some backlash because, you know, of the hypocrisy of Hollywood. When it showed uh, Chris Hemsworth naked, there was a shot where it kind of panned by and showed him and it blurred out, you know, his bottom area. They cut that from the trailer. So they show his chest, they show him naked and him yelling and angry, but they take away that shot showing him from behind, showing his full form, obviously, with things being censored out. So interesting that they've decided to cut that. I'm wondering if it's because of the backlash they got against it, because, let's just be honest, if they had done that to Jane Foster's character in the film, feminists would have been going crazy about it. And there's a clear double standard there about no problem at all, you know, sexually exploiting men, but obviously being critical of it when it comes to women in general. For me, I don't think anyone should be sexually sexually exploited, but I do think that calling out the hypocrisy is definitely important. But let me know your thoughts about that as well in the comment section down below. If you like this video, smash that like button, light up that fire button on Odyssey. Y'all all amazing and beautiful people. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, God bless. And now for a huge special shout out to my June Keeper of the Bifrost and Chosen of Valhalla level members, Brandon, let's go Brandon, Christopher Bowman, Garrett Searles, Hymir Irie Hymason, Jeff Toon, Joe Horn, Jonathan Carney, Laura, the Modern Major General Story, Father Luca, Mike Jackson, for the win, Mad Mitch Dunaway, or in chat reviews, make sure to check out his YouTube channel. He just hit 1,000 subscribers. Rosetta Allen, check out her YouTube channel as well. Stan Andrian, Miss Martin Muses, check out her YouTube channel. And also, of course, the amazing Tina B, Empress of the Universe. Check out her YouTube channel, especially her show, Soup to Nuts, that she does with the amazing Stephanie B. Thank you all very much for supporting me over on Patreon. And a huge shout out to all of my subscribers as well over on Subscribe star at these levels. Matt 317, Storm Tracker, The R, Fast Reaction, Mr. Roy, and also, of course, J Rod, The Beer Guru, and ZK Man. You guys are amazing. And a last shout out to my locals members. We have Miss Minnesota Hockey Fan. 
How about a hockey player? We have Mike Jackson for the win once again, Robert Barnes and Brett D. 90. So I want to say thank you again for being my members at the Keeper of the Bifrost level and the Chosen of All Hollow levels. If you want your name specially shouted out at the end of every single video and live stream, please check out my links at the Patreon and Subscribe Star. Uh, you can find those in the top link in the video description, the Willow link, as I like to call it. We can also get access to things like giveaways, things like the podcast I do with John the Flick Pick Flickinger and other cool stuff like that. Anyway, thank you all very much for supporting me for the month of June. You're all amazing and and beautiful people, hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, God bless.